Okay, here today we have a Renault Capture behind me here. It's been to various garages. I've been told nobody wants to fix it, or they're just blat blatantly saying straight up that they don't know how to fix it. But this one in particular has just come from one garage. It's a well known garage, um, really good guys actually. And um, they quoted them £1,900 to remove a, a sensor. Um, that's listed on there as a fault. The customer didn't even know what it was called. He said something to do with the turbo. So I'm guessing that's the turbine upstream temp pressure sensor. Um, but they, they wanted £1,900 to fit it, a new one because they said they need to get the engine out to do it. And even at that they said, well, we can just change the pipe and we can't guarantee that that's going to fix the fault because we'd have to sort of go from there basically. And yeah, so the customer didn't want to spend £1,900 on a gamble because they weren't confident that they could fix it. So he's here with me now and uh, we're going to get it plugged in. So I've just got Brian here setting up the launch scan tool. Right, I'll just jump in the driver's seat for a minute. We've got engine management light on, spanner light on, and we do get various messages of check injection, check anti-pollution system. 90,000 miles on it. Right, we just ran a scan, let's see what we got. This is just headlight bulbs and stuff. ECM, pressure upstream of the turbine, incorrect sensor mounting, fuel rail pressure regulation. Too many transition events, that was in the memory. Uh, right, so that one can be caused by many things. Fuel rail pressure uh, can be caused by if it's had a service, if the fuel filter's been off. It can be caused by a blocked fuel filter, if it's got one still, if it hasn't had the fuel filter changed. Obviously it can be caused by a bad fuel pressure regulator, fuel pr fuel rail, pressure sensor, fuel injectors, fuel pump. I mean the first thing to do with any fuel related errors, what I'll always do is change the fuel filter first. Right, so we're going to go to the stream, we've got the upstream pressure. Let's just have a look at the rail, fuel rail first. Uh, we'll select all of them, whatever we've got for the fuel rail. Right, we'll graph it up. Fuel rail pressure, sensor rail pressure. Right, so let's... Hang on, let me go back and... Can we just take a few of these? Let me just do the rail again. I just want to look at two in particular, which is, forget about the voltage, those two are in, can it? No, not those two. Right, right. That one. Let's see what they look like. Combine. That looks pretty consistent to me. Possibly a block fuel filter under a heavy load. Struggling to meet match the fuel pressure. Oh yeah, back to, so back to data stream we need to look at the upstream pressure. Pressure upstream. Now the problem with this is like I showed in my last videos, we've got a fault code log for that, so you can get a false live data from the upstream pressure sensor. Now you see that that pressure sensor reading that can be diverted when you when you've got a fault logged for this sensor it can it can divert and get this reading from an alternative sensor which is the manifold pressure sensor. Now let's go back and clear that fault code and re recheck the live data. Right now we've cleared the codes we can see we've got a slightly different reading there on the sensor itself. Which is, that is quite normal, they always are a little bit higher than, than your atmospheric pressure. Right, now let's, let's check that reading again. See? We've got our revs up and down and we're not moving. Let me just get the engine speed there just to show you for comparison. Alright, graph that again, combine. Now you see the orange graph doesn't move. 
that's when we've cleared the code. Do you see how that can give you the incorrect diagnosis there? You can say, well, there's nothing wrong with that sensor. And um, last garage had exactly that problem. I mentioned that in my last video. They said that there was a problem with the sensor, but they could see on the live data that it's working. So if they replace it, they can't guarantee it's going to work. This is why you're getting the wrong, wrong reading. You have to clear the code, then read your live data. Obviously, now within the next five or ten minutes, this fault code will be logged again. And then you will get the, the correct reading come back up on here. It's only given the correct reading because it's it's using an alternate um, alternate sensor to get its its manifold pressure reading. Yeah. Right, we're just going to run the engine for a minute. You, the nice thing about these is you've got a nice clear view there of the the fuel that's going into the into the pump. You see, it's nice and solid. It's a, it's a weird looking colour, I'll be honest. But maybe, I don't know if that's normal, I can't remember on these. This is the sensor in question over here. Okay, we don't not, we don't remove these. Um, I wouldn't remove them, even, you know, there's no way I'm, I'm trying to remove one of these sensors. The reason for that is, you, even if you get the engine out, you're going to try and get this removed, and it's going to snap inside the manifold, and then suddenly, that £1,900 coat that you've got doubles up, because now you need a new exhaust manifold, you probably need new gaskets, and is your turbo going to separate from your manifold is your sensors here are they all going to separate so then suddenly you know that code can double up we don't like touching stuff that we know uh, has a sort of 80 percent chance chance of snapping so you've probably seen my videos a hundred times now we use a cable we're going to get down here with some cleaning fluid we're going to clean out that pipe we don't need to replace it okay we've got the connector plug disconnected a little horseshoe clip pulls out of there just put that up there. That comes out here. Right, there's a little 8mm bolt at the back of here. We just need to get that open. Okay, once you've got the bolt off of there, that little bracket comes out the way. Just gives you a little bit more working room to get to this pipe down here. So it's a little, it's a pipe about 2mm, basically internal diameter, and it gets blocked with carbon, so we need to get down there and clean it out. Okay, this was very, 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 very seized on. You see there where some of the actual rubber holes is left stuck to the pipe where it's melted to it but that pipe is absolutely blocked solid but no one's had this off before no one's even had a look at this like that is quite blocked up it's blocked right up to the tip right okay so the first thing we're gonna do is just get a little bit of holes connected on here and then we just connect a clear tube up. We're just going to get some DPF cleaner down the tube. That'll do. Got a little bit too much in there, so we'll just let some of it spill out. Now I'm just going to increase the pressure up around 2 bar, 30 psi. Oh, it's come off. Right, so just put a proper clip on that because there was a cable tie on it to hold it in place. Just to hold it, hold the pressure. Okay, now we'll just let that sit. We'll just leave it at 20 psi there, one and a half bar, for five minutes. Okay, so what that does is just helps to soften up the carbon that's in there uh, before we start to try and drill into it with some of our cable here. Okay, so we feed the cable into the pipe and then I just use this just to help guide it. Then we can try and drill drill this cable down as we're trying to feed it in. So it's important to do this in reverse as well, otherwise the cable will unravel. Okay, so we're just repeating the process of putting some more fluid in and then re re putting the cable in. This can take some time. It can take five minutes, but it can take an hour. Finally got through it. See there, it's clearing out. Probably one of the worst ones we've done. So that's taken, I'd say, an hour and a half just to get through that pipe. Um, might seem excessive, but you know, I've, it's, I'm so used to doing it. We just kind of keep persevering with it, put some cleaner in it, get the drill down it, change the, the cable size, 
We try with one mil cable, one and one point five mil cable, maybe two mil cable. Keep you got to keep persistent. That's all it is. But it's much, it's a much better, not just a much better, but a much safer option than trying to remove that pipe. Like I said, you can run into so much complications trying to get this out. You got to pull the engine out. Not only does pulling the engine out bring complications, but trying to get that pipe out brings complications. And like I said, can double the estimate or a quote that you've given your customer. Now that that's done, what we always normally like to do on these is we've got that, we've got the soot cleared from there. Once we've cleared it from up from the top section, we're going to come down and now clean out the DPF as well. And we're also going to check that the DPF pressure hoses at the back of the engine are not split because these are very very common to do that. Right, so those pipes that we talk about are just down the back of the engine over there. Can't really see them from here, but it's just down there. So obviously now the next part of this job is to move on to get the soot in the particle filter here. This pressure needs to be down between sort of, I'd say somewhere between three to six millibars. We should see that. And then once we've done that, we need to sort out the fuel filter as well. Now talking about fuel filters, I don't know if you've seen my last video on this exact car, Renault Capture. It had full service history from new. I opened up the fuel filter. It had a similar issue like this. It was it would It would stall out when you put full acceleration. I opened the fuel filter housing and the fuel filter had collapsed inside. It was so old, it had never been changed. It's in a really difficult place. It's hidden behind the wheel arch. Not really difficult, but difficult enough for people not to want to do it. Which means wheel off. Some people might say you don't have to get the wheel off, but I do. I need to get this inner arch off, all of this plastic inner arch in here, get all of that out, and then the fuel filter is in there. So while my assistant Brian here gets the fuel filter out, I'll let him do the easy job. Rather not. I hate diesel filters. I can carry on and get this DPF clean and fluid into the DPF while he's doing that. We'll get the DPF cleaned down, like I said, we should see it at sort of between 3 to 6 millibars of the pressure. So that's the fluid there that we use for the DPF clean and fluid, that's part of that kit there from Launch UK. I always get people ask, how much do Launch UK uh, pay me for using their products in the videos and you know how much do they sponsor me? Uh, they don't sponsor me anything. Honestly, I'm not sponsored by a single company. The only thing that I do do... Um, if I show a scan tool and I say I'll put the link in the video, if I've got an only would not not all companies, some companies, if I've got an affiliate link, I can put it in the video. And if you buy one of the tools from there, I'll get like a five percent of whatever the, the commission is of the for buying the tool. But in regards to Launch UK, I don't even have an affiliate link for them. Um, they're not sort of up to date like that as yet. But what they are is just really nice guys. I do obviously I buy a lot of fluid from them. They sort me out give me some discount on the fluid because I buy so much and because obviously I do generate a lot of sales for them but in, in all honesty Launch UK um, or any of these other companies do not pay me five pound in, in any sort of payment fees or money for doing any of the stuff that I'm doing I just use their fluid and it's good and I'm just showing everyone what, how, how it is same as I'm showing everybody what the process is I'm doing on these repairs I don't get paid for doing that either I'm just just here to help people again of course if I get enough views on the video you'll get a little bit of monetization from YouTube for it so that fuel I can actually see water in it I can see water you might say how did water get in there it's just condensation it does happen it's not like someone poured water in your tank you do get condensation in the fuel filter housing so it is important to change it every now and then unfortunately like I said because of where this is not a lot of people does it will they'll go in and have an oil change service it doesn't even look like the air filter has been changing this in four years. So the fuel filter, I've seen worse to be honest, but it has got a lot of contaminants in there. But it's not distorted. But yeah, I don't know what all this stuff is. It's in there, sort of like jelly. Jellified. Okay, so with the cleaning done and the rest of the work done, we're now at four HPA. Uh, we can get a graph on that, graph it up. So I can show you there, and then if we hold the car up around sort of 3,000 RPM, say. We've got around about 20 millibars of pressure. So now the next thing we're going to talk about is, I don't know if we've still got the fault code for, yeah, we've still got the fault code for upstream pressure. So you remember before I talked about, let me just get that in a position where you can see the screen a bit clearer. There you go. We talked about reading the live data while that pressure sensor fault was there. So now... If we let's turn the engine off, I'll just get the ignition on so we can do the fault code clearing. Right, we're going to clear the fault code for this. Now that's done. 
Now, like I showed before, once you clear the fault code, we were getting an incorrect reading. Or sorry, we were getting the correct reading, which was showing a blocked uh, blocked up upstream pressure pipe. There we go. So while the fault code was there, we had a chart which was going up and down. And then while the fault code was cleared, we then got a different reading, which was showing a blocked reading on here. So now if we rev up and back down, see now we've got the correct reading with the fault code cleared. So now we're not diverting back to the manifold pressure sensor. And the, yeah, the fuel pressure fault has gone. It hasn't come back. We've taken it on a few miles of test drive. Probably three or four miles, I think, something like that we've done. It. I haven't really counted, but we've done a, done a couple of miles test drive on it. We've given it some high revs just to make sure that the fuel pressure is all in order that we've shown on the live data already there. So it looks like we're just about finished. Okay, so we're all finished on the Renault Capture, and I'll see you on the next video.